on that note, we're gonna go ahead and transition into the intro. And right before I, I give you all the title of the of the show, I want to ask you our question. Um, what? <laughs> good enough for me. Exactly the what I wanted to hear because this is pilots say what. Where we hear what pilots have to say. We are going to talk about examining authority today. Okay. There's a lot of things on the internet. Um, and there's a lot that's not on the internet about it. I look it up. There's not really a lot on YouTube. Mm -hmm. There's some blog posts, maybe. I really want to ask you some questions about it, given that, um, well, you seem to know a lot. And also, you're a DPE. So we can get both sides of the story. If somebody didn't know anything, let's say we mm -hmm. have listeners, and they're, they're not even aware that examining authority is a thing. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them to kind of describe what it is? So examining authority is the authority that's granted to a flight school mm -hmm. that allows that flight school to administer the final evaluation um, for a specific uh, rating. So mm -hmm. um, as compared to traditionally speaking in, in you know, the vast majority of cases, when, when you finish a pilot rating, um, the flight school's job is, is kind of done at that point. And then they send you to what's called a designated pilot examiner. Mm -hmm. And that designated pilot examiner who generally is not employed by the flight school, is going to then administer the final test to issue the pilot certificate. So mm -hmm. instead of the designated pilot examiner issuing the pilot certificate, mm -hmm. the flight school that taught that student um, is issuing the, the pilot certificate at the end of the rating. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Uh, well, and that's, that's something I read about. I'm wondering, why would this be something that matters to a student who's looking into flight school? The, the biggest reason that this is important mm -hmm. is it because it really helps unclog the pipeline. So mm -hmm. what happens generally at flight schools, because there is such a great need for check rides, there are so many people now mm -hmm. that have realized that aviation is just this awesome career mm -hmm. and um, everybody's super, super excited about, you know, getting, getting all their pilot training done. Um, there are a ton of need for these check rides mm -hmm. and there's not many designees um, in the country. So I am a designee. Um, I'm one of less than about... 1400 people I think right now mm. um, in the entire world that can administer these check rides and and you know when um, you look at the overall need for check rides I think it's in excess of 11 to 12,000 check rides mm. um, a, a year and you divide that by the you know say the 1400 um, different examiners and all those examiners you know not not all of them are going to do um, <clears throat> um, you know single engine um mm. uh, ratings a lot of them are helicopter guys people are you know balloon evaluators not everybody does all the different evaluations so you know if you say of the 1400 people um that are in that group maybe seven or eight hundred of them can then administer those check rides you divide that by this you know twelve thousand yeah. um, num number and then oh by the way this is a part-time job for no most designees a lot of them are retired a lot of them you know um a lot of them don't really want to work all that hard. Right. So what, what ends up happening is like 20% of the DPEs end up doing like 80% of the work. Okay. Mm. So really long answer to what yeah. was very brief question. And I'm, and I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Um, but what happens is when it comes time to take that check ride at the end of the end of the, um, the training is you have sometimes have to wait a month, two months to get that check ride. And then if the weather's bad or there's some sort of extenuating circumstance, um, that check ride gets pushed. It becomes this really big blockade for getting across the finish line, right? Right. Um, and and you know all that time that you're waiting, your skills are slipping. You know you're having to retrain, you're having to maintain those skills. Mm -hmm. um, so you know a lot of times when the check ride does finally come around, maybe you're not as proficient as you would have been had that that wait not had been as long. So mm -hmm. basically, this is a long answer to what what's a very basic question, but what it does is it shortens that period of time so yeah. if you get done with your all your private pilot training in two months um like you would you know at thrust flight or you know another flight school that's um that, that does the kind of stuff that we do at the end of that training mm -hmm. you take that end of course check um which is what it's called rather than a check ride in, mm -hmm. in this sort of scenario and um and you're done right yeah. so it's a it's a two-month period right mm -hmm. but if you've got to tackle on another month or two months or or God forbid, even longer than that, it really stretches everything out so, so much. And it's really, really frustrating. Absolutely. And so what, what keeps, uh, why is it that more schools don't have examining authority? Well, of the, say, 12 or 1300 flight schools in, in the country, mm -hmm. I think only about 10% of that, um, of those are 141 flight schools. So flight schools 
that are organized in such a way that, that you can get, you know, get your flight train, training done, you know, uh, in a faster period of time, you mm -hmm. know, but with that 141 comes a lot more oversight from the FAA. You really open yourself up to a lot more scrutiny. Right. So in order to have an examining authority, a prere prerequisite of that is having a 141 rating, mm -hmm. right? So for at least like two years, right? Even. Yeah. So you've got to be, yes. Yeah, so you have to be out of that, um, that provisional um, status. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have a, 90% pass rate in that rating with designees, mm -hmm. um, uh, with the look back. So again, the barrier to entry here is really, really high. If I were to ask, and this may be a more technical or maybe might even be a difficult question, but what what is there, what can the FAA do or what do they do uh, in combination with the Flight 141 schools to make sure that our EOC examiners in school mm -hmm are held accountable or even, you know, checked on. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we keep it an objective, integral system? Uh, do, is there systems for that? Oh, absolutely. You know, some it, people are skeptical on the internet. So. Sure. Well, and, yeah. and, and as they should be. Mm -hmm. um, here at Thrust Flight, um, we've got a very regimented syllabus. We have um, very regimented training course outlines that everybody adheres to. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the the the, the foundation of okay. of where we start with the one forty one piece of this. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes time to become approved for mm -hmm. um, examining authority, right? Um, it's not actually called self-examining authority, it's just called examining authority through okay. the FAA. Um, the FAA comes out, they give um, the, the chief um, pilot um, a check ride, right? To make yeah. sure that they're doing everything that they, they should be doing, right? right? So that's kind of, you know, the 10,000 foot view of, right. of you know, what does it look like and how do we, how, do, how does the FAA make sure that that's the case? But there's mm -hmm. so much more that goes into it. You know, they're, they're really diving deep into the records and the training and making sure that all, um, everything ticks and ties and, and, and everything is done just, just right. Now, on top of that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, what we've done here at Thrust Flight is because we have DPs on, um, that, that we work with every single day, because I'm a DPE, we go out there and we teach these end of course checkers how to administer that check mm. right you know and at the end of the day that um that evaluator um is going to stick to the acs and i think at the you know um at the very basic level is they need to follow the airman certification standards which spells things out pretty clearly either yeah. you passed it or you didn't right mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of gray area yeah um so i what i would say is that I am confident that the people here at Thrust Flight maintain a super high level in, of integrity. Mm -hmm. They follow the Airman certification standards, and if they're not ready to pass, we don't we don't pass them. Mm -hmm. um, they're sent back for more retraining, and you know that's always an opportunity to go back and and get a little more education, and you know come out the other end a more competent, capable, and safer pilot. You know, and I and I think here at Thrust Flight, um, that's the culture that we build, yeah. right? You know, the the end product is so important to what we do. Um, you know, unlike a lot of other flight schools. Um, that that simply want to get you a rating, right? Right. right? All they want to do is get you in, take your money, and get you out. You know, and you've got a rating, right? Mm -hmm. Just because you have a piece of plastic in your hand doesn't mean that you're a real competent pilot all the time, right? And I know that everybody here um, really adheres to our strict core value of we truly, truly want to make good, competent pilots, not right. just people with pilot certificates. Yes, I, 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 and I get that from the students when I talk to them. I go over there and I talk to them. I think I said this last time, but I, I love talking to them because I get to really see that they, they like being here and they really feel like they're part of something big and, and they, they're con they want to feel confident about the flight. I hear a lot less people talking about, you know, I see them studying, but when they're talking to each other, they're talking about maneuvering the plane and how, hey, how would you handle a situation like this? Mm -hmm. I hear them talking to each other like that. And, uh, you know, I think that's the way we probably breed people who are confident. Uh, so that would beg the question about, well, does that play a role in me choosing between a part 61 and a part 141 school? And obviously it does because only part 141 schools can get uh, granted examining authority. What I'm wondering is, is should someone factor that into choosing their school and when they're choosing between those types of schools? I know that's kind of like a broad question, but you know, choosing a, choosing a flight school is a, is a very personal decision you mm -hmm. know and, and i think a lot of it ties to what's your goal what do you mm -hmm. want to do right mm -hmm. what what is the timeline that you want to do it with within because i will tell you the thrust flight is 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 not everybody's uh, cup of tea mm -hmm. um you know we are a purpose-built flight school 
Um, one that if you want to get through your program and if you want to get through it quickly, mm -hmm. um, and if you want to be held to a really, really high standard, mm -hmm. this is the fight school to go to, right? But if you want to do this casually, um, if you want to take your time, if you want to take, you know, a, a bunch of breaks, um, if you want to get out there and, you know, see the country in an airplane building flight time, this isn't your, this, this, this is not the place you want to come. Mm -hmm. um, so this school is one that it is fully immersive. And, mm -hmm. um, and if you're not really ready and committed to it, it will break you, you know, and, and, you know, we've seen people wash out as a result of that, mm -hmm. you know, so I guess, do not come to thrust flight unless you are 100% committed to, to doing this and, you know, in kind of the pace that we do it in, yeah. right. You know, sh should your choice in picking a flight school necessarily be, do they have examining authority or not? I don't, I don't really think so. Right. I think it's what is, you know, what do you want to, how fast do you want to come out, out the other end? Mm -hmm. I think is the end of the, is, is really the question you got to yes. ask yourself. Right. And if you're on a mission and you really want to get this thing done, mm -hmm. the best thing you can do, is get yourself into a flight school and there's lots of other flight schools other than thrust flight that that, that does this and does it very well mm -hmm. is get you into the program and and again get you out the other end having examining authority is is really going to accelerate mm -hmm. that process mm -hmm. you know and and really i think reduce a lot of frustrations gotcha i can see that so so in other words um would you say that someone someone who's looking to get through a flight program feeling confident and with efficiency even mm -hmm. uh examining authority can be something that they would want to factor in but only if you're someone who really wants to be committed to a school that is something like best flight right i think you can get through a program very competently with designee and with the school without examining authority. i think you can do that in a part 61 school mm -hmm. it's just what does that timeline okay. look like gotcha that makes sense okay well that answer is a good question for me then it, it's really so flight school dependent you know there's great Absolutely. flight schools there's flight schools that are, are very casual so it, it really is, you really just have to do your due diligence mm -hmm. and really look at the flight school on a in an individual basis. You can't really force rank at part 61, part 141, mm -hmm. part 141 with EOC, you know? It, yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. There's a lot of ways to go about it. Okay. Well, then I want to backtrack to the fact that we, we are a fast track, committed, purpose-driven school. Do... The, so the relationship between that and us having examining authority, we want examining authority to help mm -hmm. be be exactly what we just mm -hmm. described, right? Do uh, how fast do people typically get through a school? Do you have any numbers on that or idea something you can so speak it, to? It really just depends on when they started in the program. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the the examining authority um, ability that, um, we've gotten has been relatively recent, right? Mm. So um, you know we're very data driven flight school. Okay. Um, you know, and, and there's people on each ends of the spectrum, you know, that, that take a little bit longer. I mean, we've had people go through this entire program um, when they came into this program with a private and finish in four months, which is just like crazy, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and when you so say it, finish, you, we're, we're all the way through multi? All the way through multi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And and he's now a assistant chief here at Thrust Flight. So, awesome. And has just done a, a great job. Now, you know, obviously that's an outlier, right? Mm -hmm. But what I would say is kind of the average track um, used to be about a 10 to 11 month track mm -hmm. um, that somebody would get through with the examining authority and some of the other things that we've we've done to kind of accelerate this process we're seeing you know eight to nine month averages now mm -hmm. and we we continually see that that tick down there's a lot of seasonality too when you start in the program um, versus you know when you finish a lot of it has to do with you starting up you know, in the winter time, right? When the, when the weather's not quite as good as in the summer. So there's a lot of different variables that yeah. can affect, you know, kind of that, that overall span. Um, mm -hmm. But generally it's, it's only going to ebb and flow by about 30 days. Yeah. And, and that makes a lot of sense. I, I think yesterday um, I was talking to someone again, maybe one of the CFIs or even one of the EOC examiners, they were speaking to how commonly people are getting or how much more common it is for people to get through the program in about nine months. Mm -hmm. And I was like, pretty impressed by that myself. I'm just thinking to myself, getting through anything that can get me into a career within nine months. I wish I knew about that when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I really do. I actually wish I knew about that. So that's one thing I like about this podcast. Uh, I wanted to ask you, so number one, you are a DPE still, right? Mm -hmm. You're still able to give check rides as mm -hmm. a DPE, right? Um, and you earlier, you mentioned maybe two to four weeks of waiting time is not uncommon for someone who's looking to schedule with the DPE. Oh, it's more than that. I mean, it's. Yeah. I would say a month is probably kind of the, the standard right now, at least mm -hmm. in, 
in this in the, the DFW market, the Dallas Fort Worth market. Okay, gotcha. Um, and normally you would have to schedule a DBE check ride for each of your check rides, which is what is there six? Am I correct in that? So it depends on how many you do, but it's private instrument, commercial, commercial okay. multi, CFI, CFII, and MEI if you do it. So either six or seven. Okay, gotcha. Um, check rides. And, so and that's look- assuming that's assuming you pass them all. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's assuming the weather's perfect on every single one of them. So it's not. You know, as far as logistically, it is, it's a huge challenge. There's a, yeah, there's a lot of variables because you got to, you got to schedule with them and then it's all got to work out and you got to pass. Well, given that you're saying it's, it's likely to be about a month of waiting time, Mm -hmm. if you pass and weather is good, Mm -hmm. then you could say there's at least four weeks of waiting, four weeks of waiting time for each, uh, check ride. Meaning, I mean, that could add on. I don't know what it's four times six. You know what I mean? They could add on twenty four months if things don't go efficiently. Mm-hmm. Of course, we wouldn't we wouldn't let that happen here at Thrustlight. But with examining authority, it seems like we have a lot more ways not to let that happen. Absolutely, does that sound right? And, and you know, typically a flight school will will try and track the progress of okay. the student to try and schedule the check ride mm-hmm. in such a way that they're scheduling maybe before they're done with their flight training mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to try and to try and minimize that wait. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that's effective. Sometimes it's not. Right. Because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as we know, in flight training, there's a million different variables and whether or not they're going to be ready when they're expected to be ready. And then the check ride lines up Mm -hmm. again. It's just this it's a very big logistical challenge. I I would say that's the biggest challenge that that any flight school is going to have is, you know, all of those those logistics that go into that. Is it just the check ride? So do is it common that uh, schools or part for 141 schools to have um, designated CFIs for each students for each student? Uh, is that part of the system that we make to make sure that that kind of stuff happens for students? Like, oh, yeah. So, that you they know, help them move. They guide them, right? Oh, yeah. So what you don't want to do is jump in with a new CFI every single time you get in an airplane, yeah. right? Um, so you know, every every uh, student here is going to have a primary instructor, and, mm-hmm. and they're going to be the ones that are really responsible, along with all the operations teams and the you know all the other folks that go into this, making sure that student is successful through the program. So mm-hmm. lots of uh, check-ins. Right. So that primary CFI, though, is, is like a go to for the student, mm-hmm. especially for guidance. It's almost like a, a counselor would be in a school or something, right? To someone they can go to and say, hey, here's how my thing's going. How can I get a check ride? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or a coach or, or somebody like that, right? Coach, so yeah. they're, okay. they're the ones that's, that are responsible for getting you know, that individual across the finish line. Okay, great. I just wanted to highlight that because um, talking to students, um, they, they realize once they got here, although there is a curriculum, the, the format of the school is not like when you go to a university, you know, you don't sit in class, but the, at the same time as everyone else, you, you come here and you participate and, and you practice and you learn skills and you do attend some classes, but it seems like with the free flowing part of our school, mm-hmm. the CFIs really keep the, the forward movement going for each student. Especially so. in the flight, you know, in, on the flight side, you know, um, there are group ground schools here where they're going to sit down and, and be in an organized class, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like a university. Mm-hmm. Um, but so much of what we do is one-on-one here at, at Thrust Flight. And, and, and really, that's all flight instruction. Yeah. Um, where the flight instructor is going to, is, you know, is really going to be the coach, the mentor, um, the therapist in some situations, yeah. right? Um, you know, to, to get that student across the finish line. Gotcha. Okay. It, did you, were you, this is kind of off track. Were you ever a CFI? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I still instruct today. Yeah. yeah I mean, I mean, I've seen you out there talking to students and everything mm-hmm. already. Um, it, can you tell me about any time that you were a CFI? I mean, I don't know if there were if there were times when you had to help a student get across the line mm-hmm. with a check ride and, and what difficulties you might have had in that situation and how you got past that. Yeah, I mean, to kind of to speak to my my recent instructing experience, and I've been an instructor since the um, I don't know the last twenty four or five years. I don't know, long mm-hmm. time. Um, and I've been in active instructing in that entire period of time. Okay. So um, there's not too many folks out there that I think can actively say they've actively instructed for 25 years. Right. Um, but kind of to speak to like my more recent experience. Okay. Um, one thing that, that I do and I really enjoy is, is I, I like to go out and fix, you know, fix the problems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Put the fire out. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, in, in what I think what we have to remember as, as flight instructors uh, and students is what's going to work for one student isn't necessarily going to work um, for a different student, mm-hmm. right? You know, there's there's so many different unique personalities, and there's so many different um, um, different ways that 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 people learn. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of time, because I I have seen so much and I have done so much instructing, is I'll go in if somebody has a real challenge learning how to land, right? Or somebody's having a real challenge with you know a certain maneuver, 
Um, yeah. A lot of times I'll go in there and maybe look at it just a little bit differently mm-hmm. and, and, um, and, and be able to offer some advice and some tips right. and things like that. And um, that's one of the things that I really enjoy is, is going out and, and I, you know, helping somebody get over that plateau, right? Yeah. Helping somebody, um, you know, fix a problem they may have been struggling with for a while. You know, having that aha moment, being a part that. of that aha moment, which is just a lot of fun for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I also do a lot of upset recovery training. So I do a lot of the spin training mm-hmm. um, here at Thrust Flight. Um, you know, well, and we learn might about... do for some more videos for that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, you do that? Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll, sit in, we'll sit in a ground class with four or five individuals and we'll, we'll do a whole lesson on, on um, spin training and, mm-hmm. and what to expect. And, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about stalls. We'll talk about, um, you know, how an aircraft can stall at any angle of attack. Uh right and i think philosophically they understand it but they've never really seen it right Right. so um you know a lot of times we'll go out in the in you know the airplane that we have here at thrust flight which is a really exciting aircraft a game bird gb1 Mm -hmm. um really you know kind of over the top airplane (laughs) um you know kind of my personal toy too so we'll go out and we'll do we'll go out and we'll do spins we'll recover from the spin the airplane will be pointed you know almost straight down right and the student will look out the the canopy and they'll say, "Holy cow! The 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 the, the ground's coming at me really, really fast, right?" Yeah. So what do they do? They pull the stick back really quickly. So what happens? We're pointed straight down. We get into a second, or we get into a um, an accelerated stall, and we're pointed straight at the ground, mm-hmm. right? And they feel that that shake in the stick, right? And you see the light bulb come on. Like I've just stalled the airplane, even though I'm going really, really fast, and I'm pointed straight at the ground. I pulled too hard, and they're stalling, right? Yeah. Um, you know, so all we have to do in that case is just unload the stick, get the airplane flying again and gently pull back. Right. Hmm. Um, but being part of that journey and yeah. like, again, because we're doing, um, you know, this kind of training in, in, in such unique aircraft, this is generally not something you're going to experience in say a Cessna 172 if you go out and you spin it. Right. Uh-huh. Um, but those are kind of the little things I think that thrust flight does, mm-hmm. um, that's over and above. Yeah. That's really going to yield a better result. That's really going to um, make a, a pilot better. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, that, that's why we do it. I don't want to, what's the word? I, I don't want to guess you up too much, I guess, for lack of a better word. Uh, but it's really cool to hear that, you know, someone who's really right behind the school, someone who's really pushed the school, you're the CEO, right, of mm-hmm. Flight. So to hear you speak about things on the ground level like that, and not only not only about the students, but even about the maneuvers and about the expertise and the skills, I mean... I think most people, probably a lot of our listeners would know what it's like to work for someone who, who wants to critique you and doesn't know what they're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. That's not, that doesn't sound like it's going to happen here. I mean, even coming from someone who's at the top. So it's, it's nice to hear that you're so in tune with what's going on. Well, you it's, still it's have just, that passion. It's not good leadership no. to, to, to speak to something you don't know anything about. And it, and it wouldn't be fair to me to, to, to go out and to lecture these flight instructors um, about things that, I, that I'm not relevant in. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I... I see these students that are here at Thrust Flight um, at the different campuses all the time, and I sit down and I have conversations with them, and that's the kind of organization that I want to lead. One that that it's open and it's transparent, and you know where we're all pulling in the same direction. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think a lot of organizations like Thrust, you're you're never going to see any of the management. You're certainly not going to see them out there pushing an airplane back or or you know really getting in there and and, and doing the work. Yeah, and you know at the end of the day. Um, that's what's in my DNA. I'm a worker, you mm-hmm. know, and I, and that's mm-hmm. what I enjoy. That's, that's what I like. Um, yeah. and I, I think that translates or I hope that translates throughout the entire organization. I think we have, I don't know, over 150 employees now, yeah. um, at thrust flight and, you know, we're, we're rapidly expanding. I was out yesterday looking at uh, sites for two new locations. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I, you know, I think that's so important as we grow and as we scale that we maintain, um, that, that, that same level of intimacy mm. with with the staff and and you know with the students because at the end of the day, um, I'm really interested in in being engaged mm-hmm. with everybody's journey because at the end of the day that's why I do this. Yeah, and I think and I and I think there's a lot of people um, that work at Thrust Flight that that have the very same uh, motivations. Mm-hmm. It's it's really nice not to be able to tell whether or not you're more passionate about flying or about the student's journey. You know, I think that's a really cool thing to not be sure about because because it seems like it translates regardless. I mean, you've always liked flying. It seems like, but they're just one and the same. 
Yeah, it's one of the mm-hmm. same. Yeah, and you want other people to enjoy flying. You like it so much that you want to share it. So much so that you would create an organization at this level just to share it. That's what it, it seems like is going on from my point of view. Yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's a whole lot else to talk about. You, We touched on a lot of great things. Um, you know, we started off talking about examining authority. Of course, we got into the, the organization and, and how much we do like sharing our passion about it. Um, I do remember one other um, one other thing that haters were talking about. And it was about, um, I have to remember because I remembered it a moment ago. Oh, the difference between flying with a DPE and someone who's a CFI and there being experience from those people mm-hmm. and, and how that would affect how they grade you and what kind of interaction you have. Can Is there, some people would, would imply that mm-hmm. CFIs have less experience flying or something of the sort. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there, can you speak to that at all? You know, a lot of it really just depends. It's a case by case basis. Uh-huh. You know, there are very, very experienced CFIs that are not designees, mm-hmm. right? Most designees are very, very experienced individuals. Mm-hmm. How relevant all de- designated pilot examiners are might be a little bit of a different story. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of designated pilot examiners, they're not doing much outside flying, or maybe they're doing flying that isn't necessarily really relevant to the check ride that they're administering, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, what I would argue mm-hmm. is that the CFIs that are doing those end of course checks, at least here at Thrust Flight, are very, very senior flight instructors. Their flight instructors have been trained how to do this stuff, mm-hmm. do it on purpose, um, mm-hmm. so that we have a really consistent, replicatable product mm-hmm. that really adheres to the Airman Certification Standards. And again, we kind of go back to what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong, and we're always going to do what's right. Mm-hmm. Um, on the designee side, again, Everybody's people, you know, people are people, right? Mm-hmm. There's, we're not robots, right? right? So you're gonna have great designated pilot examiners. You're gonna have pi- designated pilot examiners that aren't so great either. Mm-hmm. The same th- the same is gonna be true with end of course um, um, checkers, right? Mm-hmm. The, the people that are administering those, those tests. Um, so I think it really comes down to, we gotta look at the, the individual, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, can't, you, you can't say that all this is good and all this is bad. Right, mm-hmm. you can't say that it's always going to yield. You know, this is always going to yield a great result, and this is always going to yield a poor result. I just don't think it's, it's fair. Not that simple. Yeah. You have you have to look at it on an individual basis. That makes sense. And and I, I guess I mean an argument that I've heard even students say they're like, "Hey, look, I don't concern myself with that." I think yesterday again, I was out there yesterday. Uh, I don't concern myself too much with those sorts of things. I just want to do the best I can do. As long as the student is really plugging in as best as they can, mm-hmm. they're going to learn what they need to learn, and it's going to show. I feel like mm-hmm. so. I take that approach. I try to anyways. When at the end of the day, yeah. the designee on a check ride isn't allowed to instruct, mm. right? Neither is the, uh, the checker on the end of course check. They are simply there to sit and evaluate, mm-hmm. right? So what I would argue is does 40 years of experience make somebody better at doing that? Than somebody that's been doing this for a couple of years? Especially if you're following the ACS. Did I say that right? The ACS. Yes, if you're following a regimen, then there you go. You're, you're checking boxes is what you're doing. You're going down a list and you're evaluating per the Airman Certification Standard. Does this individual meet this task? Yes or no? Yeah. And then and then even then, at that point, if you're going with a CFI or an EOC that you get to work with every day, you get to get really great personalized feedback afterwards, mm-hmm. it sounds like, when you when you go over what went wrong or what went right. And you're going to so, get the same thing with the designee. Yeah. Or you should get the same mm-hmm. thing with the designee. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if you don't... Um, then, then you need to ask that designee. I, you know, I really want feedback, mm. right? Um, they're not going to give you that feedback in the moment. They're not going to give you that, or they shouldn't be giving you that feedback during that check ride. Mm. Um, but after the event is over, it should be a, it should be a conversation, right? Mm. So, um, you know, it, and you can talk about things like technique and skill, and um, you know, um, what was done really well, and maybe stuff that can be worked on a little bit. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I think we touched a lot of great bases. I mean, like I said, I've been doing some research, and this is coming from a non-pilot, right? But I've been doing some research, and there's only so much you can find. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, I really am excited to put this out there and have it as a resource for anyone who wants to know more about not only Thrust Flight and Patrick, but about examining authority and DPEs and check rides and what it looks like to move on as a student through your flight training. Since the last time you were here, Patrick, we have had a little bit of growth. You were on the first episode. This is the fifth episode of Pilot Say What. I think I have a map here for you. I just want to show you, and it should represent a little bit. It shows right here. Now, I just, just make sure that's not hurting anything like that. 
So that's a map. It's a little Holy small. Holy cow. Yeah. I'm going to turn it sideways so that you can actually like see that. Wow. So. All right. That, all over the country, right, man. That map is showing all the people we've reached so far. And I think within four episodes, all over the country. If, you know, if I nitpick, there's maybe not even a handful of states that we haven't touched yet. Uh, I'm pretty proud of that. It's yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to let you know that it's going pretty well. And for the listeners to know that if you haven't yet, if you're on streaming platforms, it'd be really great if you could give us any sort of rating, some sort of follow Spotify, Apple Music, Apple Podcast, all those platforms have a feature like that. It really helps us out a lot, especially if you did enjoy everything. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, of course, the subscribe and like button are great. And of course, we have thrustfly.com where you can get as much information as you want, including calling us. Thank you for joining us on the fifth episode of Pilot Say What. We'll be looking forward to having you with us again on the next episode.